Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess, and I've got a bit of a, um, a hoarse throat today um, for lots of different reasons. So I'm going to apologise in advance if I lose my voice during this. And um, but <laughs> the guest we've got on today is the wonderful Carrie Jones, who for some reason has decided to come back, um, <laughs> which <laughs> I'm very surprised at, considering the last time. Um, I'm sure she didn't enjoy any of it, but she's back, and I'm really pleased to have her here because. Along with um, Eliza Lambert, who I think you know really well, mm, probably yep. the two most highly functioning females I know in the world, <laughs> more clever than any man that I know, um, and, <laughs> and in your in your respective specialist subject, I think you know there aren't any people better than that. So, uh, Carrie, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Paul. I, that was that was one hell of an introduction. You can introduce me anytime. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was, and now you've got to live up to it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't know Carrie, very briefly, um, we did a show um, about Dutch testing, which is um, mm -hmm. hormone testing um, using a specific method, and she is medical director at Precision Analytical, who are basically Dutch, and they um, provide this service, which is phenomenal, and you can get mm -hmm. so many just crazy amounts of information out of it, which I can't understand why people don't do it more. Um <laughs> But um, if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to that, that episode because there was a lot of really good stuff came out of it. And then from that, I decided I'd like to drill a bit deeper into some specifics. Mm -hmm. And I messaged you and said, let's talk about DHEA. And yes. you came back and went, yeah, that would be really exciting. <laughs> of course. Of course, that must be amazing, right? So, yeah. um, so I want to really dig into that and see what it is because... Lots of people, when we talk about hormones, know what testosterone is, or mm -hmm. I think they know what estrogen is, um, but there's so many other hormones that are floating around, um, and one of them is this thing called DHEA, so, you know, from your perspective, what is it? Well, believe it or not, um, DHEA is a, one of my favorite hormones. It's, uh, it's considered an androgen hormone, like testosterone, but it's actually predominantly made in the adrenal glands. It's made in the zona reticularis, part of the adrenal glands. And um, it's really quite protective. Uh, it's protective against cortisol. It's, a, it's made in the brain as well. It's a neurosteroid, which means it does good things in the brain. Um, it helps increase things like BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, which is really good for brain, um, brain health, right, neurons and whatnot. And um, we, use it, we use it for energy. We use it for muscle building. We use it for stress response. We use it for all sorts of things. And um, like I said, about, about well, 100% of our DHEA S, S is the sulfated form, is made in our adrenals. And about 80% is made in our adrenals and of the DHEA. And the other 20% is made either in the ovaries or in your testicles, depending if you're male or female. So, um, it, and then like I said, a tiny amount is made in the brain. So it's, the body thinks it's important to put it in those, in those three areas. And it's hugely important because when you don't have it, um, you really feel it. And, you really feel it, yeah. And it's not unusual to have low levels of DHEA. Correct. Uh, especially the sulfated version, right? Correct, yep, yep. Um, on sure. a lot of the blood tests we do, so this is this was something I wanted to ask you specifically. So on the blood test that we do, that they have an optimal range, as well as the doctor's normal range, and right. when we look at DHS, the what they're trying to do is get you to have uh, levels of a thirty-year-old. Mm -hmm. That's what the recommendation is. Because DHEA starts to decline naturally as we age. Yeah. Yeah. And it's got an anti-aging component to it. Yeah, absolutely. And the things that that lower that are what commonly well so it's, it, believe it or not it's like if you have high stress high cortisol DHE will go up but it because it's made in the adrenal glands anything anything that affects the hpa axis so anything um that affects brain communication to the adrenals will affect your dhea output so very similar things that affect cortisol or adrenaline noradrenaline will also affect DHEA. And then of course, just like I said, it's, it starts to decline naturally with aging. And so if you're doing all the things to make yourself stressed out and your cortisol is going down, your DHEA probably is too. Um, so stress, lack of sleep. Yeah. Inflammation. 
Believe it or not, um, inflammation for sure will lower the ability for DHA to sulfate. So it will, right? So DHA S, S is the sulfated form, and inflammation lowers sulfation. So it just pushes it down the pathway, inflammation does, and it doesn't increase your DHA S. So it, Whereas insulin does the opposite. Insulin can increase DHA S. So if you've got high insulin, if you're insulin resistant, say, and there's a lot mm-hmm. of high insulin floating around, would you normally then have a high DHEA? Typically. Typically we see a higher DHEA. Okay. Yep. So, so yep. from my perspective, interestingly, and we may get into some weeds here, but when we do our bloods and we find people have got high DHEA, yes, mm-hmm. it tends to signal inflammation. The high stuff tends to signal high inflammation from other markers. So we tend to see it comes with high levels of glucose, high C-peptide, mm. high insulin mm-hmm. fasting. Um, mm-hmm. So, and the body kind of so, gets a bit inflamed from those some from those other things, potentially um, uh, high homocysteine as well. But, right. so, so this is where I think I'm getting it wrong now because inflammation will push it down. The inflammatory cytokines. So oh. like IL-6, things right. like that. So it's the inflammatory cytokines that will push it down. And again, it's associated. Inflammation lowers sulfation, right? We know it blocks sulfation. Does it do it in everybody? Absolutely not. And if you have two, if you have high insulin and high levels of inflammatory cytokines, now you have a tug of war. So you might, the insulin wins, so to speak. Yeah. You might have high DHAS. I mean, you may, you can be inflamed and have high DHAS. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. But what we see in research, when we see people with lower DHEASs, which is what's great about the Dutch test because they'll have a low DHEAS, lower, maybe not low, but their testosterone and their androgen metabolites, EDO, calanolone, androsterone, the 5-alpha, 5-beta, androsinodiol, will all be in range, or maybe they're high. And so I now know they have this discrepancy between the S, DHAS, and all the downstream markers, which is why the Dutch is so nice. So I can say your androgens as a family aren't low, just your DHAS's. You have a sulfate problem. Uh, no, what, other things can cause it, right? You can have yeah. a salt snip issue, right? S U L T. If you know your snips, you can have a salt snip issue. So you can't get the S on. Um, and so if you've got that, or if you've got a sulfation issue, right? You get your sulfation pathways aren't good, then you're not going to be able to get your S on. Okay. But inflammation is so common, we just like to point it out to people to say, hey, you may notice as you address their inflammation, wherever it is, their head, their skin, their gut, their joints, that their DHAS naturally improves. And what would be symptomatic of low DHAS? Low DHAS with low androgen markers or low DHAS with normal or high in the rest of the androgen markers? Because okay. remember, the androgens are a family. So yeah, yeah. if you just have one, if just one family member is problematic, is low, is not functioning well, but the rest of them are good, you may not notice anything because everything else, your DHEA, no S, your testosterone, your EDO, your andro may make up for it. But if the entire family's low, then you're definitely going to feel more fatigued, more brain fog, you know, gaining weight, less muscle mass, those sort of more stress, um, inability to handle your stress. That's what you're going to feel if the the whole family's low. And and DHEA, S... What's the next stage from that? What does that then go on to do? Because it, 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 it doesn't. Off. So DHAS is an end stop point, right. and then the body has, and it's neutral. DHAS doesn't yeah. do anything as far as we know, really. Um, but you take the S off, and now DHEA is what's active. It goes downstream and does the thing. So DHEA can become androsinodione, which can become testosterone, or it can become estrone, which is an estrogen, or it can become the further metabolites, etiocalanolone, androsterone. So DHEA, no S, can go on to be a whole, go do a lot of other things, which is good and bad depending on what your levels are and, and how well you can sulfate and unsulfate. So for example, think menopausal women. When women go into menopause, their ovaries don't make estrogen anymore. So they rely on the ability of their androsterone uh, and their testosterone to make E1 and E2, they're two estrogens. This happens in the fat tissue. It's called aromatization. And so, um, well, primarily it's to E1 and then E1 becomes E2. But if you are missing DHEA, let's say you are a very stressed out, exhausted menopausal woman and you don't have a lot of 
DHEA production, you may be missing out on then androsterone um, or androcytidione, and then that's not going to make E1 your estrogen. So now you are not only DHEA deficient, androcytidione deficient, but you're estrone deficient. And you are a menopausal woman who does not feel good. And yeah, we feel really not good. Really not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Now, in, over here, you can't do it, but in the States, you can walk into a, a CVS. And, and buy DHEA on the shelf. Yeah, yes, in, you can. <laughs> in, in, in all sorts of uh, milligram dosages, you know. Yeah, like one, you can do everything five, from, yeah, one to, 20, to 50. You yeah. can get 50 milligram. I don't recommend it, but you can. Yeah, <laughs> now here's the thing I was going to ask you, right? It's really dangerous just to walk in and go and start popping DHEA because... It's a hormone. Yeah, well, there's that. And also, yeah. <laughs> people think it... It's really difficult, but basically people think if you just take something it only affects one thing right so if you have a headache and you take a paracetamol it only affects my headache right which isn't true right it has a systemic right. effect on you but right. hormones it's even worse and when people start taking them uh off a shelf unprescribed mm -hmm. what kind of problems can we can we see ourselves running into the biggest things that we see with the high DHEA is they will say, I took DHEA and my face broke out. I was getting women. I'm getting hair growth in places. I don't want um, men and women. They'll say I'm getting uh, bald. I'm losing my hair. I'm getting my hair spinning. Um, mood changes. I'm angry. I'm irritable. I have no patience. Um, and you can have anger, rage. So it can definitely push that androgen side effects. I mean, it could definitely put people into a bad skin, hair, mood state for sure. Men especially, um, they can increase their estrogen and don't even realize it. Because again, DHEA, no S, becomes androcytidione, which becomes estrone, which is one of the estrogens. And so we see that a lot in men on Dutch testing and hormone testing in general, blood, saliva, it doesn't really matter. We'll see men go out and buy 25 milligrams, 50 milligrams, God forbid, 100 milligrams. And then they're like, I don't feel, not only do I not feel better, I'm gaining weight and I'm developing breast tissue. And like, what's going on? I'm like, well, you're pushing your estrogen pathway because you're doing it unsupervised. You maybe shouldn't have been on it. That should, maybe 100 milligrams, 50 milligrams is too high of a dose. And you also, gotta, they're not clearing out that estrogen. Yeah, which is the other thing too. Absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. So they make it, they're over aromatizing into it, and then they're not able to detoxify it out of the body. So, say someone's done that and they've created this mm -hmm. issue, what, where, how do they go and start fixing it? Because it, it's actually more common. Stop the DHEA. Than, yeah, there is that. Is there, is there any way to uh, improve the, 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 the long term effects of it or the removing of the issue? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, well, one test, <coughs> see on your estrogen detox, what's going on? Is it a phase one is it issue? Is it a phase two issue? But even, I, you know, I tell people, um, even just general liver support. So if you, you know, looking at things like choline and, you know, milk thistle and even the, um, even the quote unquote detox teas, you know, that have all the herbs in it that are good for detoxification. Like if you've, if you've taken, if you're listening, you've taken DHEA and you're like, man, I, I have all those symptoms. I've really screwed myself <coughs> up. Stop the DHEA, you know, and work to try to get it out of your system. Um, but if you know what your estrogen detoxification pathways are, if you've done the Dutch test, then you can use foods and supplements to focus on phase one, and then you can do the same to focus on yeah. phase two to help get it out. Now, we have to be careful, though, because um, everyone jumps – when we're talking about estrogen detoxification, everybody jumps on the supplement DIM, methane. It comes from your broccoli, kale, cauliflower family. And in men, it's really not so much of a big deal um, if they go on DIM. But in women, it, they can, it can lower their estrogen too much. And so what happens is women will go on high doses of DIM because they have all these estrogen symptoms and they feel really good and then they feel really bad. And they'll start to feel bad because they've depleted, not depleted, but they've, they're draining their estrogen out of detoxification too quickly. And I'll see this, especially in like the menopausal women. Again, they already have low estrogen and then they put themselves on dim. And now they're like, my hot flashes and night sweats are worse. I'm like, I know because you've, you're actually, you've increased the clearance. We have to be careful with men too. I mean, men need some estrogen. Um, you know, they, men don't need zero. They need, it's, it is helpful in their body as well. So with, we have to be, you know, test first. Don't just randomly put yourself on this because you 
read it in a blog post or yeah. listened to a podcast and said, that sounds like me. I'm just going to go buy it. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a massive danger currently. Like, there's so many yeah. people doing that. And there, and there mm-hmm. are so many um, differ, differing opinions on things and they are all purporting themselves to be the, the definitive answer to everything. Right. So, you know, if, if, if you're a, a keto zealot, then that is the, all there is and you can't do anything else. You, if you do, right. then you are clearly uninformed and I need to make sure that you're aware of the mistakes you're making and, and bring you right. to the dark side. Or, <laughs> or you know, a high fat, low carb or, or low, low fat, high carbohydrate approach is the only way to go as long as you're in a calorie deficit and all this sort of stuff. And, it, you know, it, everyone's different. Um, and it's all it is very individual but um, get away from that here's a question that popped into my head I have known many women who are on HRT a synthetic mm-hmm. version but they still have um, the the flushes mm-hmm. and the symptoms of menopause mm-hmm. now generally when I speak to them uh, it's been it's been prescribed by a GP Mm-hmm. And I'll ask them, you know, have you had your hormones tested, the, the pathways? Mm-hmm. And the answer is always no, because mm-hmm. that's not what they do. Certainly not. Right. Have, anyway, what would be, in your opinion, and I'm probably going to get, it depends as an answer, but what would be <laughs> the reason that someone's on HRT, but then they're still getting those menopausal symptoms? So I actually think there's a few components to this answer. I think... Um, one is probably the form, maybe potentially the form that they're on, if they're on synthetic, even though for years before the Women's Health Initiative came out, women were on synthetic hormone like Premarin and Provera, which was shortened to Prempro. Um, and they felt, a lot of women felt great. All their, their hot flashes and excellence went away. But still, it is a synthetic form, and not all women do well with synthetic. And, of course, now we know um, some of the fallouts of, of that of that study um, and being synthetic. So switching to a bioidentical form might be good. Now, the other issue is the way that it's taken. So let's say most of the synthetic is, um, a lot of it is oral, so a capsule that you swallow. Sometimes they'll do, um, well, actually all the synthetic is oral. Um, but what there's different options. There's a patch, there's a ring, there's creams. You know, there's all sorts of different things that you as a person, as a woman, you may do better with the patch. You may do better with the, the topical cream. Um, just because of your body or just swallowing a pill may not really work for you. And then on top of that, you know, nothing else is looked at. So it's like, oh, you have hot flashes, you have night sweats, your perimenopausal menopausal let's put you on these hormones. But did they ask about their stress? Did they ask about their adrenal health? Have they checked their thyroid? Have they looked to see if they're anemic? Are they asking them about their diet, their gut health, their digestion, you know, there's what they do for a living, how much sleep they're getting, they're, they're happy in their relationships. Women forget as we go into menopause, um, I call it reverse puberty, right? So like, do you remember puberty coming into being a woman and now you're going into menopause? So you're coming, you're, it's the opposite. It's like a reverse puberty. And so it, it's, your hormones are in chaos. And so all the things that you used to do for years don't always necessarily work anymore, anymore. Because you used to push it and you used to burn the candle at both ends and you used to be able to maintain your weight or, you know, eat your diet. And it's, it was OK. You knew it wasn't that great, but like it, it, it held you. It held you where you were. And now you go through perimenopause and menopause and women say, I'm gaining weight and I have all these symptoms and I can't sleep and I don't know what's going on. And I'm like, I know and you have to look at it as from a much, much, much bigger picture. So just going on synthetic hormones like here, here's your magic answer. Mm might help some of it, but it's so multi-pronged approach because it, you know, synthetics probably, bioidentical is probably a whole lot better in my opinion. And you may be on the wrong type, oral versus topical versus, you know, a patch or, you know, something. And then on top of it, or, you know, a vaginal, whatever. And then on top of that, there's like all these other glands nobody looks at. Yeah, absolutely. Adrenal, thyroid, and, gut. And that's the thing that I that I can't understand. I mean, I, I can't understand it because I, I know how the system works. But yeah, it's, it's bizarre how a, a GP is confident in saying, "Yeah, look, here's your here's your HRT. You're you're mm. this age. You've got these symptoms. Clearly, this is what you need." And right. they don't take into account any of the other peripheral stuff that is so important if you're going to manage it properly. Right now. There's a, there's a guy that I know uh, called Yehudi Gordon, who's a really good guy over here. But he's okay. late 70s years now, and he's been doing it for donkey's years. 
bioidentical, mm. one of the first people to be doing that um, in the UK, 40 odd years ago. Um, and with him, it's a cream, it's compounded mm -hmm. to, to what you need, and all the bloods are done, and every mm -hmm. few months it's reassessed, where are your numbers, it's adjusted, and so on. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sadly, the GPs don't have time or money to do that. And, right. and, and the crazy thing is, it's not even that expensive. Right, you know, I've right. I've worked out about a dollar a day, maybe, or something right. like that, if it's, if it's American numbers, right? So, I mean, I mean, it's not even a, a, a hugely expensive thing, but um, it can make so much difference to the, mm -hmm. the, the way the woman feels and, mm -hmm. and, and, and just to alleviate the frustration they get from going to a GP and saying, look, I'm taking this stuff and I still feel like crap. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of them just go, look, they're not doing anything for me. They just keep saying, well, we'll change it to something else. Or they'll put them on an antidepressant. Oh, yeah, here's your Prozac. Right, here's your Prozac. Yeah, absolutely. Never bother to look at anything else. Yeah. So I mean, and, and like I was saying, so much changes in as you head into menopause for women. Like you have to have your thyroid checked because it might have been fine in your 30s, but now as you head into your 40s and 50s, you know, there's a lot that changes and your thyroid could be one of them. You've been burning the candle at both ends, like I said, and the adrenals are what make cortisol. They make DHEA, which we've been talking about. They make adrenaline and noradrenaline in the body. And if you're getting, if you're not taking care of yourself, and now your brain is telling your adrenals, hey, you know what? Let's slow down. Let's make her slow down. Like, let's just not put out as much hormone as we used to. And now she's tired, right? Now she's got skin changes. Now she's gaining weight. You know, Now she can't sleep. And so it's just this pattern. And But all they're doing is focusing on one little aspect. Yeah, and, and Here's also, your pill. Here's your pill. And, and, yeah, and if, I'm, if I'm correct, higher cortisol can interfere with the conversion of T4 to T3. It so can. A lot of things. Down. Yeah, yeah. But, high uh, high estrogen, high leptin, yeah. Yeah. And you get low iron. Stressed, get more stressed over it and your sleep's yeah. worse and then you get weight gain and you get fed up with that and that's more stressful and then you under yeah. eat because you're trying to right. lose weight and then right. and then God forbid you then go and do a load of cardio at a gym <laughs> or you know, and pile even more on it. Right. It's, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a really common pattern that you know, there are lots of roads, but they all lead to the same place. In other words, mm -hmm. it's a very common pattern as people get older, and men as well. I see mm -hmm. it in them where they're trying to keep up with what they were doing, and, you know, it's all starting to not go as well as it should or was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they go harder down the same road. Right. They under-eat, they over-train, they under-sleep. Right. You know, the food's not great. They've got, they're stressed about all other things in their life. Uh, right, now, everything. Further down. And the whole thing starts falling apart. Right. And then you try and say to them, look, you need to eat more and, and stop training for a bit. And they look at mm. you like, you're insane. No way. I'm yeah. Like <laughs> huge and fat and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing because it's just so common and yet so many people miss it completely. I know. Don't know. And, and I, but even the GPs, I mean, even the GPs here, they just don't, they don't get training in it. But, you know, visits on average are eight minutes. Yeah. 10 if you're lucky you know you can't go over a whole case I can't ask somebody in 10 minutes tell me about what you eat what your day's like tell me about your sleep what supplements you're taking you know I can't family history I can't do that in 10 minutes yeah. you know it's it's it doesn't work it, it doesn't work and doesn't. and so and then they don't get trained on you know proper workup even if they're like you know what, we're gonna run some blood work first and then I'm gonna have you come back they're running very basic because yeah. that's what's covered and then and then it's missing so many other markers. And a lot of them are pointless. Yeah. TSH. And you go, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You're, well, I was gonna, how does it get even worse like when they run a CBC, red and white blood cells? You know, which is yeah. good to know your red and white blood cells, but, you know, I mean, to the average menopausal woman, if she's not sick and fighting an infection, and, you know, she's just like, I'm having hot flashes, and my mood is crap, and I have no sex drive, and I put on a bunch of weight, and they're like, well, here, let me, let's me let run your red and white blood cells. Like, I don't want to tell anything. Yeah. <laughs> like, why don't we look at something else more important? Um, and, I'd rather and, you pick like vitamin D or iron, you know, yeah. G30. <laughs> and also, it doesn't take eight minutes to fix it. I know. You know it doesn't take eight weeks to fix it. Mm -hmm. with, with, with my clients, the minimum is six months of work because mm -hmm. it's not about saying, right, okay, you're short in vitamin D, here's a supplement, off you go. It's mm -hmm. about the... The, the reason you, these changes have occurred 
or the deficiencies or the health issues we've got underlying the cardiovascular risk or whatever it is, mm -hmm. is because of the habits that you've been following for the last 20, 30 years. And we've got to change those habits because right. you're in control of that. You know, you're yes. not necessarily in control of the, the health side of it. Leave that to me. I'll, I'll work that stuff out for you. Mm -hmm. But I just need you to change that habit of stop eating cereal and orange juice a couple of sugar in the morning. Right. Let's just maybe deal with that this week and then slowly make those little changes mm -hmm. and over. And, you know, if they've got some serious issues, it takes months to, to really get on top of it. Um, well, my mentor used to, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people say this. So, I mean, my mentor used to say it takes about a month plus for every year you've had this. So when men and women come in and they're like, I have all these symptoms, and I say, well, how long have you been struggling with this? And they're like, well, for the last 15 years, but in the last five years, it's been a lot worse. It's been getting more progressive. It's rap, you know, coming on rapid. I'm like, all right, 15 years, five is the last five years pretty bad. Like, I, I'm not going to just like you said, I'm not going to fix this in five days. So call me in five days and tell me it's not better. Yeah. It's going to take, right? 50, I can't unwind 15 years in five days. So we need we need several months. But the challenge we're up against is that they go to the doctor and they give them something that's going to work straight away, apparently. Right, right. But it doesn't. It just makes life worse right. Or, or, right. or postpones it a little bit longer. Post, especially like especially with women, right? Like, here's, a, here's your Prozac and here's your birth control pill. Yeah. <laughs> knock, knock yourself out. You're going to have a great yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be one big party. So, <laughs> talking of... Um, so, um, people getting older and you know hitting that 40 plus and we're going to get menopause and, and perimenopausal for women and guys you know naturally testosterone and other androgenic hormones start to decline um, symptomatically a lot of them will start to put weight on symptomatically say it again the, the, a lot of them Head will start out. to put weight on oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. and uh, you know a lot of people will say well, middle age spread and all that kind of stuff <laughs> But nowadays, I feel people are far more conscious about it and they're far mm -hmm. more bothered about it because mm -hmm. we've got such a huge media presence of these people uh, in front of us all day on, on Instagram feeds or whatever, the social media mm -hmm. of your choice of, you know, here, let's talk 40 plus, for, for mm -hmm. example, you know. Here we go, look, this guy's 60 years old and he's got a six-pack and he looks amazing mm -hmm. and this, that, and the other. And that's mm -hmm. why you should all be like, take this testosterone booster or whatever crap you see, right? <laughs> right. But, but people have become far more conscious about it. You know, five generations ago, if you got to 65, you were doing well. Yeah, never mind, just in general. Yeah, never, never mind shredded and d doing 150 kilo deadlifts or whatever. So, <laughs> so we see this natural progression of weight gain. And I, I speak to a lot of people. In fact, I, before we start recording this, I had a meeting with a client and she asked me, okay, and she, she was 42 and she's saying to me, it, the, way, the reason I can't lose weight is it, um, it must be hormonal. Mm. So I said, okay, well, let's talk about that. So being as you are a hormone expert, <laughs> from your perspective... Well what can you what what would you say would be some of the reasons hormonally that people can't mm -hmm. seem to lose their body fat and remember hormones when when men and women think hormones they think men think testosterone yeah and women think estrogen right often but when we think hormones we have our sex hormones testosterone estrogen progesterone we have our adrenal hormones cortisol DHEA norepinephrine, epinephrine. We have brain hormones, right? Serotonin, GABA glutamate, things like that. We have thyroid hormones. And so when those go wrong, <laughs> one of them, two of them, all of them, then we can absolutely get into a weight gain situation. But what I say to women or men is that when you hit your 40s and you're having all these changes, your thyroid is changing, your ovaries are not putting out progesterone, you know, not ovulating like you used to, your estrogen is sort of going up and down and eventually goes down. Men, your testosterone has been gradually declining, but you're also having stuff in your lifestyle, right? You haven't changed any of your lifestyle stuff. You, you know, you haven't stopped drinking and you, you haven't stopped eating cereal and you're snacking late at night with that glass of wine and you, your stress is still really high. You, you've got a, your job and you've got your kids and you've got your relationship and you're 
like you very you know, get much sleep and you could you could thrive on that in your 20s and 30s and then you hit your 40s and the body's like yeah I don't want to do this anymore like I can't do this anymore we're making this transition this life transition this biological transition and you have been using me and abusing me and it's it's going to get tougher so I'll say to women when you have shifts in your estrogen you'll tend to gain weight but you'll gain weight faster if you haven't been taking care of your lifestyle, your sleep, your stress. If you have shifts in like the hormone leptin, not many people talk about the hormone leptin. It's a hormone that has a lot to do with our hunger, or we call it satiety, how hungry are you, and energy burning. So if you've got leptin issues, then you're more likely to hold on to your fat and, you know, gain weight. I mean, if you've got thyroid, if your thyroid slows down, you, you know, the thyroid's big on your metabolism and it helps with skin and your hair and, you know, your GI tract and your mood and all this stuff. But if your thyroid slows down, it slows everything down, including, you know, we call thermogenesis, you know, like burning of energy. And then cortisol, when cortisol is high, you, you've got a lot of stress, you're not sleeping, you know, you know, the kids, the kids are home with the flu, the job is not what you wanted, you're fighting with your partner because you're not happy, you're not sleeping and the kids are sick. Now your cortisol goes up and that increase in cortisol can directly impact your sort of middle age spread, like you said, it like makes that fat in the middle go go bigger, which we don't want. And then other hormones, pancreatic hormones, glucose, insulin, insulin, you know, like insulin, the higher your insulin is, insulin resistance, the more weight we put on. So it's, it's, I know people listening to this are like, holy crap, I don't even know where to start. That's so overwhelming. I'm like, yep, absolutely. That's why you need a practitioner. Call Paul, <laughs> get it on this program. Um, but Remember, these things are amplified and they're worsened if you don't change any of the stuff you have control over. Women, you can't control menopause. Like, you're going to go through it. I'm really sorry. It, it sucks when I am the goddess of the female body. I will make some changes, but I'm, I got a long wait. I'm not the goddess yet. So we have to go through menopause. But what we can do are control things like what we say yes and no to and what time we go to bed and what time we turn off our phone and what we choose to put in our mouth and you know, how we have our relationships and all these things we absolutely have control over. And that will greatly help these transitions. And the same for men, men, you know, I'm sorry, your testosterone, our lifestyle, your lifestyle and the environment is making your testosterone go down, 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 but it gets amplified and goes faster. If you use plastic and you keep drinking alcohol and you keep eating crappy things and you don't sleep because men, you make testosterone in your deep sleep. So if you're not hitting your deep sleep, then you're not going to make very much testosterone. And so these, but these are controllable things. You as a person can go, Oh, you know what? I can get off my phone tonight and I can go to bed at a decent hour and I can focus on deep sleep. Like I can do that. I'm like, great. Like I can cut down on my alcohol and that will help my body make more testosterone. Like, yes, it will do that. You know, I can choose not to drink out of plastic containers and not get that, um, bisphenol A, that BPA exposure that causes testosterone and men to go down and estrogen to go up. Like, yep, men can do that. And so by helping those things you can control, then you don't amplify when your hormones go awry. And it also seems that as we get older, so if you if you look through your 30s into your 40s, as that time progresses, the amount of actions that we take that are detrimental mm -hmm. be, increase. Mm -hmm. So because you're looking for, you know, it, it, <clears throat> like your body's kind of not handling it as well. So to, right. to get the value you want or the, the energy or the sleep or whatever else, well, I need to get my sleep so I'll have the alcohol. Now, right, never right. used to have to do that, but now I do because it helps. Right, and then, well, you know, I'm, I, I eat this food, but I have to because I've been so tired. It's energy for me, and, right? And it kind right. of layers and layers. And, and as we get right. more fragile, if you like, the, mm -hmm. the the stimulus, the input that we put in, gets worse, and that compounds it even further. And absolutely. What you, and what you say is absolutely right. You know, you don't know where to start, and there is so much of it, and that's why it mm -hmm. takes time to change those habits coming back to that you know change the habit and then right. the other things will start falling into place because you're in control like you said of, of that yes absolutely yeah, which I, and I think and i you know, my whole goal one is education but two is empowerment you know you you even just sleep i get asked a lot like what's the one thing you would if you 
if you tell, you know, what's the one health benefit thing you would tell everybody? It's sleep. If you can get good sleep, if you can get your circadian rhythm dialed in, if you can go to bed at night, not use alcohol, you know, like fall asleep naturally, you know, be careful of not eating heavy meals before bed, if you get rid of the sugar before bed, if you fall asleep, stay asleep. It's in your deep sleep that men and women um, go through all the repair. So at night, when our, we had our deep sleep, no REM is when we dream. REM is the REM sleep is we hear about all the time. That's when we dream. But deep sleep is when um, we call it our glymphatic system with a G. So we have our lymphatic system and our brain, the glymphatic system. And what it does is it's what when we heal, repair, maintain, clean out the trash, you know, of, in our brain, so that we wake up feeling refreshed, restored, ready to go. And that's when men make make testosterone. It's why your testosterone is high in the morning. It's why other things are up at first thing in the morning. If, because if you're right, lucky. Oh, <laughs> yeah, because, because I'll tell you what, yeah. I mean, that's a question I ask a lot of people. Do you get a morning erection? And the amount mm -hmm. of them that say, not really. Right. And that's, Not as much as I used to. Any age, by the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. it's in that deep sleep that your yeah. men, your testosterone goes up to give you a morning erection. And so it's a great telltale of when you ask, how are your morning erections? And if their men are like, oh, I don't know, or they come and go, or I haven't had one in a while. Yeah. I know right away their sleep is not good. Yeah. They may think their sleep is good, but I know their sleep is not good. And, and the, the deep sleep is the first couple of hours. It is the first couple of hours. And if you've, yeah. if you've sedated yourself with alcohol, yeah. you're never going to Or anything to, else. Yeah, you're never going to get into that deep sleep because you're, right. you're, you, you haven't gone naturally. But, but you know, interestingly, um, what's your take on melatonin? Because there's, there's an awful lot going around saying, you know, it's actually really good antioxidant, it's got some really mm -hmm. high benefits and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Clearly we make it naturally because that's what puts right. us, to, well, that's what right. sets up the stage for us to go to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of people saying, you know, um, it, it, some people are talking about 10 milligrams before. It's a lot. It's <laughs> huge, I mean, it's massive. That's a massive amount. That's got to oh be like 100,000 times more than we naturally make or something. More, oh, way more physiologically. It, from the pineal gland anyway. Yeah. Um, so, in, so we make melatonin, believe it or not, primarily, as you, well, you know, we primarily make it in our gut. Yeah. But we do make it out of the pineal gland in our brain, and it's the it's like the moon. Cortisol is like the sun. So at night, as it gets darker, the pineal gland says, "Oh, it's, it's dark coming in my eyes." We start to make melatonin. Now, as humans, we screw that up, right? We're on our phone, we're on our computer, we're watching a bright TV right in front of us, and so that that bright light, that that white light, has a bluish tint, and the blue tint makes our brain think. Blue is in the sky. Oh, it must be sunny outside. It must not be time for bed. And so it delays our ability to get to sleep. We, we get this delayed melatonin onset. And so what people will do is they'll say, well, I'll take melatonin and I'll, and I'll force the issue. But they never fix the problem of stopping the bad habits, going to bed early enough, you know, winding down at night. They just jump on melatonin. And so I get, I get told a lot, well, when I go on melatonin, I sleep. But when I go off of it, I get rebound insomnia. So melatonin doesn't work. Like it does work, but it's a band-aid. It's a hundred percent a band-aid because if you don't ever, if you're still on your phone, if you're still, you know, on your phone um, before bed, if you're still watching TV on your tablet or computer and you're up at night and you're, you know, you're doing stuff at night, you're in big meals and you're having dessert and then you have a glass of wine or whatever. And then you take your melatonin because that's just your quick pill to put you to sleep. Like you never fix the cost. So I'm not against melatonin, um, but I am all for working on sleep hygiene and working on what things you do to wind yourself down, go to bed, whatnot. Melatonin absolutely is a very powerful antioxidant. Um, and some people can't make melatonin. To get from serotonin to melatonin, there are two SNPs, there are two enzymes that make that process happen. And I've had a few patients over the years who are, have um, one or both SNP issues and they really struggle to make melatonin and sleep is a huge problem for them. And so in that case, I'm like, look, you can't physically make it. You should probably be on melatonin. Yeah, and, and in that case, it makes perfect sense. Total but, sense, yeah. If, if They'll be to, on it. Yeah, life if, but if it's to compensate for your lifestyle, then that's right. really not a good reason to take it. And that is another hormone that you can walk into a pharmacy in the U.S. and go and buy it on the shelf. You can in, You can buy it at the airport. Yeah, you can buy it at the because gas Because it's great for jet lag. <laughs> they put it, they'll put it in water. You can buy it if you're in an international, you know, mm. travel wings of airports here. 
you'll find like sleepy water and it has melatonin in it and it's to help you fall asleep on the plane on long haul flights. Amazing. Yeah. What, what, Which is, it, you know, it does its job, right? Like absolutely. If you, if I'm going, if I'm going to see you in the UK, I mean, that's a, that's a nine hour time difference yeah. forward for me. So if melatonin does help me flip my circadian rhythm. Do I do it all the time? No, absolutely not. Do I do melatonin on the regular? Nope. Actually, melatonin doesn't work that great for me. I don't need it. That's not my problem when I sleep. And mine's more cortisol, adrenaline. Okay. So, and when you take 10 milligrams, like you said earlier, um, you know, melatonin makes you feel drowsy. So I do have people that say, when I take melatonin, I wake up really tired. Like, yeah, it's a drowsy hormone. The next day, a lot of people are just non-functioning. And then what do they do? And, and, yeah, well, then they've got to jack themselves back up again on caffeine yep. and whatever else. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, it, it, yeah, it's just, it's just interesting to me how, you know, I keep saying we're supposedly the most intelligent we've ever been, the most advanced and the rest of it, and yet now we've got melatonin water at an airport, which is going <laughs> to get abused. It's going to get used for some of the wrong reasons. But never yeah. mind that, you can walk into a chemist, into a pharmacy, and then pick up hormones off the shelf and just self-medicate as much as you like. Yeah. Um, we have progesterone over the counter here. Nice. You can just go into Whole Foods and get progesterone cream. And when I hear it all the time. Women say to me, they write me on Instagram, and they're like, oh, yeah, I read a, I read an article. I saw, watched, you know, watched a podcast and went to Whole Foods and bought progesterone cream, and now I use progesterone cream every night. And I'm like, not being – it's a hormone. Like, yeah, not yeah. being super wise. That's like a real deal hormone, like DHEA. Are you sure about that? Yeah. Someone sent me um, a, a, an advert the other day, and they said, what do you think about this? No, it was, it was an article in, in, in a paper. And um, it was a testosterone, a woman, a woman sent it to me and it, it was uh, aimed at them and it was a testosterone cream uh, in the UK, which you can't mm. have, you can't buy that. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, that's a bit peculiar. Anyway, so I looked at it and it was actually a compound, it was a peptide compound cream, yeah. uh, which is firstly unregulated, so the quality control of it is is nothing but it was it was marketed or said that it was a testosterone cream but the peptide within it is supposedly to increase your testosterone production oh okay being aimed at women right right it's gonna help you sleep better and recover from your activity and blah, 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 whatever right right and she said oh what do you think and i said do not ever read that paper again <laughs> <laughs> well, that yeah. is just complete madness and yeah. yet, I've got no doubt they'll make, you know, they'll take a lot of money on the basis of that. Oh, people, they'll take millions. People just aren't, anyway, we're going to get off and, yeah, and, and, and I'll tell you. Yeah, for sure. Can I, I, and you, you know, I will, I will clarify, which is one thing, because I know I get asked this a lot when I say that men, men make testosterone in deep sleep, and so women will say, oh, do I too? I'm like, no. No, sorry, women, it doesn't work that way for you. Uh, men get it, men make it out of their testicles, their latex cells in deep yeah. sleep. But women... Women make testosterone out of their ovaries, and we, we also make it out of our adrenal glands um, yeah. and, and our fat tissue. We can we can make it uh, and we can convert it in fat tissue. But no, the more fat tissue you have does not mean the more testosterone you have. More estrogen, yeah. yeah. Or but yes, you can absolutely increase your estrogen. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, that'll go up. Briefly on sleep, as soon as we started talking about that. <laughs> yes. So, so you get to sleep okay, you were saying, but you've got cortisol issues. Does that mean you're waking up about three o'clock or something like that? I used to, you know, what was my biggest trigger? Um, so, which I didn't do very often, but when I did do it was alcohol. Okay. If I had a glass of wine, so I would have the occasional glass of wine. Okay. Um, and instantly three in the morning, I was right awake and in, and up, of course, if I'm really stressed out, uh, about three o'clock two three o'clock is when I'm, when I'll wake up, which in Chinese medicine, of course, is liver time, which right anger and processing. And so it makes perfect sense. So I don't drink really any alcohol at all anymore because my sleep is more important to me than having you know a glass of wine a couple times a month so and, and something else i forgot to mention you were talking about the deep sleep first two hours that and, and you kind of touched on it but you, you you skipped over it slightly was that that's the time you clear out this amyloid plaque that builds up oh, in, your, yeah. in your brain yeah and that's yeah. the stuff that causes alzheimer's and dementia yeah, and I know Matthew Walker's book. He says very clearly, you know, if you're getting, if you're not getting your deep sleep, or you're getting mm -hmm. less than six hours a night of total sleep, then you've got a forty percent higher chance of Alzheimer's. 
which is so scary. It's so scary. My deep sleep goes, um, I was, I was literally going to pull up my app and just show you my, right, for tracking, um, what my deep sleep, my deep sleep, if I go to bed at 10, my deep sleep, I come in and out of it between like 10 and about two in the morning. That's about sometimes three, three thirty in the morning. Um, that's when I'll, I, I'll come out of my deep sleep, but my, I've got this sort of expanded it, and you know, obviously I'm coming in, it's not deep sleep the whole time, but, um, yours is, it is extremely frustrating to see your aura ring print, you know, when you post it, you haven't done it for a Why? while, which is quite nice. I'm, I'm quite glad because it's, it's always a great deep sleep and a great oh. REM sleep. <laughs> And my deep sleep is shocking. And, and yeah, I, think I know. You know. I know. I'm really shocking, right? And there, there are some things that, that work to kind of improve it for a short period, and then it goes back to what it was and everything else. And, and I'm going to put it down to um, children and uh, I don't know what else. But, um, yeah, so... so yeah, I will tell you. So my girlfriend, my um, one of my... my well, my best friend... Um, she just got an aura ring and her deep sleep was in the minutes, six minutes, 12 yeah. minutes, 30 minutes, two minutes. And she just got it six days ago. So last night she said, I tried, um, CBD for the first time. She said, I tried some CBD stuff. And what's funny is I, I cause obviously we can get, we can get everything in the United States. So yeah. right, I can get CBD, but I have a topical CBD, <clears throat> topical CBD, that you are to apply and just CBD, there's no THC in it or whatever, less than 1%. And you're, it's a topical and you're supposed to apply it to the back of your neck and it's for, um, sleep and it's for the headaches, migraines, that sort of thing. The theory behind it is it's closer to the brain. Yeah. So I, and I found it, I was cleaning out drawers. <laughs> I was in it, you know, we have millions of supplements. I'm sure you have a huge supplement cover like I do. So I'm cleaning up and I was like, Oh yeah, the topical CBD. And I thought, oh, you know what? I'm going to try it again. Why did I stop doing this? And I did it. And my, at the same time, my best friend just did oral CBD. And she texted me this morning. And she said, my deep sleep is an hour and 23 minutes. And I said, mine was two and a half mm. using. And the only thing both the two of us did, not talking to each other, we just happened to randomly do it last night, was add in CBD. CBD. And yeah. I don't know a lot. I mean, I, I, I know I don't understand the mechanism of CBD and deep sleep. I don't know how CBD could potentially push you from REM to deep. I don't, I don't, I don't quite know that mechanism of action yet yeah, in the endocannabinoid I, system. I tried it for a month and it made no difference. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for the story. Again, not something else that doesn't work for me. Um, <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a puzzle at the moment. And um, uh, it, it, sometimes it works. Sometimes. One of the other things that I've looked into as well is um, to get a, a, Cassadian rhythm, right? You know, one of the things is to get light exposure in the morning, right? So yeah. first thing you get up and get some sun on you. Yeah, uh, it's a little bit difficult here at the moment because it's dark. Um, same, well, same. It's snowing at the moment here, so it's actually yeah. been. Uh, it's February, and yet today, no, sorry, yesterday and the day before, the two hottest days ever in February. So it's been really bright and sunny, <laughs> but generally it's not great. <clears throat> so there's a lot of talk about um, natural light. Bulbs, not natural yeah. light uh, mm -hmm. things. Sit back down for a couple of hours and see how that mm -hmm. how that goes. And um, and then there's something else called human change, uh, human charger. Have you heard of that? No. Uh -uh. So, uh, you know, if you're watching on the video, then you'll see uh, a little bit of this. But basically, can you see that? Oh it's yeah. Not, it's not great. Look at that. So it looks like a little old iPod. Yeah. But what it does is in the in the um, earphones. There's the lights, so they're, they're, they're uh, sunlight uh, lux frequency, okay. and you put them in your ears, okay. so you don't have to sit in front of one, okay. and, uh, and uh, supposedly it goes straight to the part of the brain that recognises it's daytime, and you only need to do it for like 12 minutes, rather than yeah. two hours. Mm -hmm. And um, and I kind of did it for a while, and it, and it had a hit and miss effect sometimes it was better sometimes it wasn't and i lent it to a friend of mine who's trying it currently but um yeah i've, kind of, I've tried lots of things to try and get that deep sleep um improved. yeah you know the other thing that helped my deep sleep which i have posted about is i made my bedroom my, i made my house colder oh, at night yeah. and that's helped uh that'll help that helps significantly with my sleep i'm, I'm cold yeah, which... i i i i have an ongoing battle with my other half because she's got this <laughs> we've got this quilt which is like 
you know, if you were an Eskimo, you wouldn't want something as hot as that. It's crazy. <laughs> And um, and honestly, the first time I think we got it a couple of years ago, it's only on in the in the winter. <laughs> oh my god! The first night, it was like being in a sauna. I was like, "What <laughs> is going on?" Um, well, that's, well, so you're detoxing, right? It's, you just, it's, like, a, it's like a sauna quilt, so yeah. you're just sweating it yeah, out. <laughs> and, yeah. So they, they, I mean, I, I get, I definitely like the fact to have a, a colder room. Uh, and on that, actually, um, you know, Jonathan Cohen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I was chatting to him the other day because I had some issues. I was really finding my memory going really bad. Oh, yeah. And um, and it was it's something that's happened in the past. And, and you'd forget, you know, the usual things, forget people's names or can't think of a word and all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. you know, is it sugar? Is it inflammation? Brains inflamed. Blah, blah. And um, sleep hadn't been great um, for lots of different reasons. But I um, was chatting to him about it, and he was talking about um, a, 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 a filling in my tooth that I recently had. And he was saying, you know, it could be some some um, connection to that. It was yeah. an amalgam. It was a mercury filling, um, which you know, should get removed. So I thought, okay, right, I'm going to get some work done on my teeth and whatnot, and that's fine. But in the interim, um, I went and got some saunas. Uh, we're going to mm. talk about saunas. Um, and, and followed by a cold shower, and mm, I tell you yeah. what, within a week, it changed completely. I mean, night and day. You know, no problems with it with memory at all. The mm -hmm. BDNF and the bring down a bit yeah. of inflammation probably in the brain and stuff really, yeah. really changed it. Really and, stimulated your vagus nerve. Yeah. Um, and some of these things are so simple. Yeah. And we forget about them. You know, 15 minutes in a sauna, get out, have a warm shower just to wash the toxicity mm. off. Yeah. And then stick it on cold. Yeah. Um, and, and the first time, I remember doing it, because I used to do it years ago, and just you fall out the habit of it. Oh, completely, yeah. And, and the first time, it's like, well, I put one arm in, and then I just put the other one, and then just <laughs> splash it on my face kind of thing. And, and within a week, you can stand under it pretty mm -hmm. much as long as you want, and, and you're totally right. used to it. Um, yeah. But it made, makes a massive difference. And, and that also has a bit of uh, influence on hormones as well, that, that yeah. whole well, if, shock if, kind of thing. If you think about it, when you when you don't sleep and your cortisol is high, then you don't lay down the short term memory in your hippocampus. And cortisol can actually be quite damaging. Well, norepinephrine can be actually quite damaging to cells in the hippocampus, which is, has a lot to do with memory. And so, when men and women tell me, "Oh my God, I'm having memory issues," I, 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 same thing. I ask the question, "How's your sleep? How's your stress?" Because memory is formed in the sleep, and then cortisol, norepinephrine will really effective effect the hippocampus that short-term memory and so i will hear that i'm like no no you're not you're not becoming alzheimer's not dementia probably it's it's situational and if you can get that under control but when you do the sauna with and then end it in cold or even a shower even you know people this time yeah. of year and who in our who are in our hemisphere not like australia they're hot um but our, like they're taking hot showers because they're cold it's cold outside and i say well if you end your shower in some cold you stimulate that vagus nerve, which is very parasympathetic, right? It's rest and digest, and it drops cortisol and, and can help take the pressure off. So, yeah. And, and um, as uncomfortable as it is at the beginning, right. it, it becomes a really um, stimulatory shower when you, yeah. when you do it. Um, <clears throat> so that little one's not been well for a little while, a few, for, for a few days, and we've not had much sleep. And I was really tired the other day. Got and and you know couldn't be bothered to do anything. Got in the shower, had the shower, and then had a turn it on cold. And honestly, mm -hmm. came out and and different, completely. Mm -hmm. You know, energized and feeling really really good to go. Um, and when you understand the value of it and you actually feel it, it's not mm -hmm. that bad when you're doing. And it doesn't. It doesn't cost anything. No, just exactly. shower. It probably saves I mean, you some money on heating. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, like you're paying for water, but it, it's, it's not like you have to go buy a pill or you have to go, you know, pay yeah. for a program. You just end your shower and cooler water and get out. So, so you know what else would also save you a lot of money is if you didn't eat anything. Ever? Well, for, for like a for like a, an experiment, say. And recently, I think that's what yeah. you do, right? Right. So, that's and, I wait, diet. and I wanted to come in onto this because um, it's the last it. thing before before we wrap up, and um, and I was really interested in, in your posts about it and mm -hmm. you know how you felt after it and so on. And and I'm going to tell you why in a second. But 
tell us about yeah. that because you decided you wanted to do a fasting mimicking diet. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a well-known commercial version of it that you mm -hmm. did. Um, yeah. And, uh, and how did you get on? Um, so because I work for Dutch, which is perks of the job, we decided to turn it into somewhat of a little experiment. So in the lab, I think four, maybe five of us have done it where we did the five, it's five days, fasting mimicking diets, five days. And we did Dutch testing the day before, so our baseline, all five days of testing. And then the transition day, which is day six, and then back to normal eating on day seven, um, yeah, so I I have eight I have eight days of collection on my cortisol, and I will say um, because it's prepackaged, you know the one that I did, like you said, it's sort of the trade. It's the brand trademarked thing. It's prepackaged. I didn't think about it. The first day was miserable. It was so awful because it was a mind game. I was so hungry. I would have eaten you if I would have been in contact with you. I would have eaten anything if you would have come to my door. You, I would have eaten you because. I was so hungry, but once I just got over that mentally, it was, I wasn't really hungry. I just knew I couldn't go eat and snack and, you know, have all the good yummy things. I had to eat their food. Um, and then the rest of the time was, was pretty straightforward. I was tired. I unfortunately never got that euphoric feeling. I never got that rush of energy. I never got immense brain clarity that everybody gets. Um, I have had several people say, you try it again. You're supposed to do it. Uh, sort of three consecutive like times in a row, you know, do it, do it, wait a month, do it, wait a month, do it, wait a month. And that's when you get the max benefit for longevity and all these things. Um, but uh, my cortisol, so I tested every day my cortisol. I tested, of course, my cortisol awakening response. And my baseline is completely normal. I go up and then I come back down just like you're supposed to with cortisol. And then the first, you know, as you go through my, uh, results stays, you know, one, two, three, four, my cortisol gradually gets worse and worse and worse. It looks terrible. And that's about how I felt. And then on the transition day, it starts to look normal again. And by this, the, by the seventh day uh, of testing where I'm back to normal, like my cortisol awakening response is back to normal, um, which goes to show that the body, you know, is a stressor. My body responded exactly how it was supposed to, um, to, for the fact that I was doing this fasting mimicking diet. And then when I went back to normal eating, which is fairly healthy, uh, my body was like, great, thanks. And rebounded itself back to normal. So I was pretty proud of my HPA access for taking care of me. Now my hormones though, my, I did, um, I collected my estrogen and progesterone marker through my entire cycle, which is just in the month of January. And, um, I'm now doing my washout. So in January I collected my, um, my estrogen is, Normalish. My progesterone doesn't look that great. I ovulate, but my corpus luteum, uh, the lutein cells, are not producing very much progesterone. Um, I did not collect in February, and then I will collect uh, this while well, heading into March. And so I want to see did the did the fasting mimicking diet affect my estrogen progesterone at all? Is that why my progesterone is not that great? Or if my March looks the exact same as my January, then probably didn't affect it. It's probably just me. Hmm. And, so, and, yeah. and, and how many calories a day was were allowed on on the plan? Um, I believe it. Like the first day is just about a thousand, and then after that, it cuts down. Um, so it, you sort of vacillate. I believe it's. I should know this better, but I think it's around eight hundred ish, okay. maybe less, seven hundred to eight fifty, depending on what you do. So you know what's interesting about that, right? Seven eight hundred calories a day is kind of a normal diet for a lot of people. A lot of people, Especially yeah. Especially women will go, yeah, yeah. that's all, you know, because I'm going to get fat or whatever else. Right. And what, what I wanted to, the point I wanted to make was that the, the stress it put your body under, mm -hmm. you know, is another really key indicator for these people who are under eating mm -hmm. because they don't want to get fat and natural fat is probably making them worse. Right. You know, they're under eating, they're putting their body under stress, not just for five days, but for 52 weeks a year. And, and they, and I was tired, right? I was tired. Yeah. I, my brain clarity, a lot of people do get brain clarity by the end, right? A lot of pe people say by the fourth or fifth day, it's elation. They feel so much better. I never got that, unfortunately. So I could imagine if that's how you eat normally every day and you come to your practitioner and you say, I have brain fog and I'm tired mm -hmm. and I'm moody and I can't lose weight. And oh, by the way, I'm only eating, you know, some yeah. soup, some crackers, 
oh, maybe shit. a protein bar and that's it, you know, and that's pretty standard. I, I can relate to that after five days of this. So a friend of mine, um, uh, I think set off to do a seven day fast, like no mm -hmm. food and, um, got and basically the same story as you, as you said, hated every minute of it, mm -hmm. felt awful. Sleep was disturbed. Mood was terrible. You know, he, he got none of this clarity out of it. Um, he just felt really bad. And I think in the end he did four and a half days, I think. Um, and just went, I'm done. I'm, 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 I'm over it. I'm, I'm, yeah. So here's my thought on this. Um, and, and other people have come to me and said, you know, I think I'll do a five day fast. I want to get the autophagy value, mm -hmm. the, the detoxification, all the rest of it. And it's going to feel amazing and stuff. I've not met anyone yet that's said they felt amazing. They've all given me a story like you. But mm -hmm. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It clearly does. Right. People talk about it. Um, from my perspective, if you're going for that, you know, longevity and kind of detoxification kind of thing, if you're just intermittent fasting, you know, and, uh, and doing the 16 8 or maybe a slightly shorter feeding window, and then mm -hmm. maybe once a week doing one meal a day, so you've got a 24 hour, I think mm -hmm. you're pretty much going to be keep your sanity, keep your cortisol under <laughs> control, and you can do that forever. Right. You know, so you're going to get the much longer benefit from it, not just five days of quite intense stuff that's going to, you know, potentially make, make your body quite stressed. But the other thing is, I think the reason people don't get that elation out of the out of it sometimes is because their body's quite healthy. And yeah, and I've had people say that to me. They said, "Well, you probably already eat well, right? You probably already take care of yourself." I I have had some people comment on Instagram one that it helped stop their um, snacking. They said they realized they snacked all the time. They did the five day plan. And it broke their snacking habit. I had another woman write me, I think yesterday, the day before, and said that it really helped her uh, glucose and insulin. And so she did the five days, and it, that it, so she had a lot of glucose insulin imbalance, and it really helped her. And um, what's and so she said, what what about you? And what's funny is one of the other doctors at the lab did it as well. She did. I finished mine, and then she was so I was ahead of her in the in the in the timeline. And I said, you know, when I stopped the plan and went back to regular eating, I was starving. Not only was I starving, I was craving sugar. I had immense, horrible sugar cravings that lasted for several days. Mm -hmm. And then they went away. And I told my girlfriend this. And when she came out of, in the, of the plan and went back to her typical balanced, high plant, you know, she's gluten-free, she's dairy-free, but she's super healthy, good fats, good protein, whatnot. And she said, same thing. She goes, I can't. She was, I'm craving sugar like crazy. And I don't suspect it, it was a pancreatic thing. I suspect it was more of an, an adrenal thing, an HPA thing. Yeah, uh, because it's, right, adrenaline. it's glucose, it's cortisol that, and norepinephrine, epinephrine that manage mm -hmm. your blood sugar. Yeah, and ghrelin being ramped up, saying, go and eat now. You've not eaten, get yeah. some food in you quickly and get it yeah. very dense and make sure it's as quickly as possible. Um, yeah. And it, it lasted, I mean, from, it probably took me four or five days and same for her. She said yeah. it took her longer than she expected. She wasn't expecting it at all. Yeah. And then four or five days of her body to be like, you like starving, starving and craving sugar, go eat sugar. And, yeah. a, and, and that's why that, I think if, if people are fundamentally healthy, mm -hmm. uh, which the majority of people are, mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not sure it has that massive value to them. You know, by all means do some intermittent fasting or, or have a short, feeding window, give your body a bit of time not to be to have to digest food. Maybe right. do a 24 hour fast every couple of weeks or whatever else it is. It's not difficult, you know, have mm -hmm. dinner and then don't have anything till dinner the next day. It's not like it's the end of the world. Right. But, but when you're well, I think it just stresses the body. It's like, hang on a minute, I'll be getting yeah. all this food <laughs> and all these nutrients. And now all of a sudden there's zero. What mm -hmm. is going on here? And, right. um, but I just think it's a very good therapeutic protocol for people who are not well. I completely agree. Yeah, and I definitely don't want – I um, again, like I'm not bashing the program. It just – I don't – that one time I did it, I didn't get any of the benefits I was quote-unquote promised and saw in the book. Mm. So I'm mad. But, I, mm. you know, people say, well, try it again. You know, that's what happened to me. But the second time I felt so much better, and by the third, it was I got all the elation and the memory and the, you know, energy and all this stuff. And 
And I joke, my family lives a really long time. My, you know, grandparents were hit, were in their nineties. I, I've been, I'm 40, I'll be 42 in June. And most of my grandparents, I were still alive. I mean, even up my, in fact, I still have a grandparent. I'm one of my grandfathers still alive at 92. And so like, do I really, how much longer do I want to live? You've got the longevity gene in you. I know, I'm like, I think There's I have the longevity gene in me. I'm, I, you yeah. know, and I, and I do a lot of the right things. And so I was joking back, like, how, how important is that autophagy for me? <laughs> and you enjoy food. And, so, yeah, I, I know. and not being stressed. And, and not, know. not you know, attacking the mailman when he turns up because you need to eat something. And I know. <laughs> keeps you out of prison, if nothing else. Um, Harry, listen, it's been great, as always. And we're over an hour already. Um, I'm sure I could speak <laughs> a lot so. more. But thank you so much for coming again. Thank you um, for having me. I may well end up messaging you randomly and saying do you want to come back on and talk about something else because yeah, of it's, all, it's always really interesting however um dutch.com is an amazing dutch company test. dutch test.com sorry amazing yep. company that does some just phenomenal um testing that gives us such great information so if people want to just go there and get a test can they or do they have to come through a practitioner what's the score with it uh, Ideally, we highly recommend people go through a practitioner, um, which we can help them find all over the world. Even, you know, for those listening in the UK, there's lots of, like yourself, lots of fantastic practitioners. Um, but when you have a practitioner, they can determine which test is the right one for you, get your whole story, and then obviously interpret the test for you yeah. and come up with a plan. We can't do that at the lab. We just administer the test. Yep. Yeah. And if people want to find out more about you or follow you, that you're because you're quite prolific on Instagram. <laughs> Instagram is the place um, to be for me. I, yeah. And that's uh, Dr. Carrie Jones, is that right? It's dr. dr. Dot Carrie Jones. Okay. And that uh, we'll put it in the show notes now. You better click straight on it and go and have a look. Yeah. Um, anything else that they can find out about you or places that you think they should go and check out at the moment? Um, well, listen to our prior podcast be- between you and I because, boy, we had covered a lot of cool stuff there yeah. too. Good. Thanks for that. Get them to go back and download that. All right. Listen, exactly. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming back on. I know it's very early there. Um, <laughs> and um, and I look forward to us speaking again virtually or in person. Um, I love sure it. Same great. here. <laughs> and um, we'll catch up soon. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks. All the best.